just oh, we're okay. okay. I've what? been here for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> look, I'm all grown up. I don't need my leg chair anymore. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Well, good morning. Welcome, and uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. <coughs> Mr. Bennington. Here. Mrs. Downs. Here. Mrs. Eubank. Here. Ms. Larimer. Here. Mr. Pullman. Here. If we could now please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did anyone happen to see the little boy say the Pledge of Allegiance at the Democratic mm. Convention? No. No. no, I didn't watch it. Oh, he may have been five. Oh, cute. Was it, it was, one of his grand, grandkids? <coughs> you know, I walked in just as he was saying it, just as he was starting, so I don't know who he was. But it was so adorable. Aw. He was at that age where he said to the public, to the public. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to the Commodore Building. We thank you for attending this uh, morning's Board of Education meeting. At this time, we need a motion to adopt the proposed agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. And now we go to the consent agenda. You can see that we've got some personnel issues to deal with. To, uh, uh, <coughs> you can see we go from uh, number four, four two, four three, and four four over to four five with classified substitutes. Do you have a motion to adopt the, the uh, consent agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions about the consent agenda? Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Okay, other items for consideration for approval. We'll turn it over to Superintendent Mr. Hustler as we discuss the memorandum of agreement between the Perrysburg Exempt Village School District and OPC Local Number 242. Mr. Hustler? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, <coughs> Okay, is that better? All right. So, um, so, uh, so we have uh, we started bargaining after the pandemic began, and typically we wanted to begin um, with this, uh, you know, prior to that. 
Um, but just the way the calendar worked out in a normal year, bargaining before we would have wrapped up by the summer um, and if everything went according to plan, but that didn't happen this year. So as a result, um, we weren't able to bargain. That created two obstacles uh, with the, this, uh, this union. Um, the union represents secretaries and bus drivers, food service, custodians, um, all the support staff that, that go into keeping the buildings and, and uh, district kind of running. And um, uh, so we did begin bargaining uh, this summer, uh, you know, working around the restrictions of getting people in the same room together, which is pretty important with the bargaining <laughs> process. Um, we hit kind of a roadblock because prior to uh, the closure of schools, um, we were operating under the way the world worked then. After the schools closed, we're now operating under an entirely different world. And, um, and, and that also impact how we're operating. And unfortunately, right as we began to, to bargain here recently, we, we also had to reduce staff because the demands of the job under how we're you know, starting the school year with the hybrid changed the requirements of what we needed for folks. And certainly that took a, uh, took a toll on, on members. Um, and we're hoping to, to, to change that as soon as we can and get everybody back to school full time. And then the staff that works with those students will be back too. Um, but we're not there right now. So, so there was kind of a, um, a cloud that hung over the whole bargaining process. But um, we, we, with the help of a federal mediator, we were able to, to reach a tentative agreement. Um, the details are, are you know, in this uh, document, which we can talk about. And um, you know, the, the uncertainty of how the school year begins, the uncertainty <coughs> of you know, the financial picture, you know, we get pieces, you know, it's almost like a cloudy day where we get to see the sun and we have a little better understanding of where we're going. Um, and then it clouds up again, and then we get to see a little more sun. So we're piecing together what that's going to look like. But, um, you know, this is a, a group of folks that really are on the front lines. As we drove to the meeting this morning and we saw school buses, mm -hmm. um, these are the folks that are bringing our students here and the ones that are making sure everything's cleaned and sanitized and taking on that extra responsibility. This union represents those folks. So, so with that, um, the agreement um, begins effective September 1st. Um, there, there was a uh, salary uh, that was, the salary that we have in the tentative agreement is really broken up into first semester and second semester. Um, this spreads out the cost over <coughs> the year because you, know, you take some of it in the first semester and then the second semester is the additional amount. So the first semester is a 0.75% increase um, and then on February 1st, there will be an additional 1% added to that. Um, and, you know, so when, when you look at the, the cost of that, at the end of the year, um, it's 1.75, but over the course of that year, you're really paying, um, you know, less in, because you're not getting that 1% until February 1st. So we talked about the cash flow and how this kind of matches that. Um, there's also some concessions with health care that were, I know are very important to this board and continuing to try to contain costs. Um, you, know, in, in, you know, in the underlying conversation that we had at the table, and, and I know reflects the board's interest, which is you know, representing the taxpayers at the table and making sure we're getting the best value. But also we're in a time where you know, finding and staffing uh, our, our needs becomes more and more of a challenge. And, um, you know, and these are the folks that really make the buildings go in terms of operating and supervising and, and so forth. So that's a pretty tough uh, niche to find qualified employees. And, and so trying to find that balance of, you know, people wanting to work here and not going up the road to Amazon um, and, you know, doing the best that we can to keep costs down. So I think this uh, contract balances that um, OPSI uh, ratified it on Monday, and we scheduled a special board meeting so the board could consider this today. So, um, uh, you know, 
so we're, we're looking at that. Um, also, uh, there is a wage reopener for next year, and, and what we did is, is essentially said that um, with the teachers' union that is bargaining next year, um, the teachers are in a different union than OPSI, so they're not linked together. Um, but we also said that based on the results of negotiations with the teachers, that OPSI agreed to, to take that amount, um, which uh, would result in us not having to sit down with, with that union again like we had to this time, and, and basically being on par with the other employee group here. So, um, uh, so there's an attachment which has the, the um, memorandum of agreement and it spells out the terms of that. And, um, you know, also there's uh, um, one thing that we're doing here as well is the uh, uh, cafeteria um, staff. Uh, there's salary tables for all of these different positions. So if you're maintenance, if you're grounds, bus driver, if you're the head uh, cook um, or cafeteria manager, if, if you're a playground monitor, Every single one of those positions has its own salary schedule and table because those positions are very different in terms of the qualifications. Being a bus driver, there are more qualifications than being a playground monitor. And the hourly rate, because these folks are paid hourly, um, there's a um, different salary schedules based on those jobs and their requirements. And, um, and in those salary schedules, over the years, things get a little wonky, I guess would be the best way to describe it, <laughs> where you start and every so, so many years you advance through that salary schedule. So one of the things I know that was important to the union um, uh, previous contracts was trying to, to make those similar to each other so there wasn't so much disparity. Not in the dollar amount, because that, that won't change in terms of what you're paid per hour, but if you're starting and then you are at five years, how do, you, how do your steps match up? How big of a step do you get? That was what was wonky. So with this contract, we're also addressing with the cafeteria staff, making those steps more in line of what the other folks are, are looking at. And um, the next contract in 21-22, in, uh, we also made a commitment to, to tackle the um, monitors is another one of those salaries that, that just, you know, over the years I think just got kind of, I don't want to use that word again, but wonky. Sloppy. Wonky, yeah. <laughs> so, and this tries to, to make it so that those steps that staff are experiencing are relatively similar to what other um, classifications are getting. And it took decades to get those out of whack. And, and I know the union's been trying to chip away at that, so it also meets their needs there. So um, not everything that we wanted w is achieved in this contract. Not everything they wanted is achieved in this contract, and, and that's usually the sign of a fair settlement when both sides say, okay, um, you know. Um, but uh, you know, that, that's what's led us today to bring this to the board for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hostler. How about the questions in regards to the OPSI contract from Mr. Hostler? I'm good. Okay. At this time, then, we'll ask for a motion. So move. Second. Again, the motion is to accept the uh, contract between the Perrysburg Executive Village School District and OPSI Local 12 243. Roll call, please, Mrs. Harrington. Mrs. Downs. Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? I'd like to abstain from the vote if possible. Okay. And Mr. Pullman? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Kelly said. Abstain. I, I'm going to abstain. Um, I'm not sure you can do that, can you? Can you do that? And, well, I guess you can abstain. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Yep. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Okay. Okay. okay, is it uh, you. you want to item, a motion passed? Yes. Well, thank you. Well, again, uh, Mr. Hostler, as you, you alluded to with respect to the uh, contract, um, we need these workers, uh, bus drivers. I, I noticed this summer and this past spring with the uh, pandemic, it began March 16th, the 
the, the folks that are gathering the lunches over the toth and all the work that went into packaging the breakfast and lunches to get it to the folks that uh, needed them. Um, the work never stopped. Uh, you know, there's always pre the preparation part, but even the custodians cleaning and getting our school and our classrooms ready in a normal time, let alone the pandemic oh, yeah. time. So yeah. we can't thank the folks that are members of OPSI enough for all the work that goes in the background. So thanks for the uh, negotiating uh, that fair and equitable contract on both sides. It, uh, I'm glad it worked out the way it has. So with that, we'll go to uh, item number six. Is there any other board discussion or any new business to bring up at this time? Um, yeah, I, I was wondering if Tom or Brooke could address Nova and what happened yesterday for us and update us on what's going on. Sure. Um, so, um, and I, I have a, a presentation just on the first week, but I'll address that, and I do mention it in the presentation. Um, so, uh, what be, this week began the registration process for the, the PVA, uh, Perrysburg Virtual Academy, and um, there was uh, some uh, difficulties that people experienced in that process. Uh, those ranged from uh, logging in and and also it, it was um, when they were able to log in, there were some duplications. So when they pulled up their schedule, some <coughs> courses were listed, for example, like they had two courses. Um, so um, uh, Brent Swartzmiller, Joe Sarns, um, and the team worked at um, basically uploading the courses again, matching it to the individuals, and they're gonna be sending out a restart, which should address all of those things. So today there's information that's going out, but um, you know, we have a, uh, a plan to, you know, communicated yesterday with the families what was happening, um, our steps to, to correct that, and, and then getting that, um, you know, families, uh, the information that they needed to log in and access the courses that they that they needed so do we know why it happened I mean that the that scathing email that we got last night um, I, I wrote back and I said well it kind of reminds me to when HPI opened and it was a hot mess and it's now one of the premier schools in the state and I said we can we know that that's our standard, so let's hope that it's something like that. We had an, we had an oops opening, yeah. but it's gonna become one of the premier standards, and I, I, I don't understand really yeah. what happened knowing how much work went right. into that, which the public, the people who enrolled, they're not seeing, right. especially with the crash and burn yeah. yesterday, so yeah. I, I was just, I was just really concerned. Yeah, I, I know that's it's your real house. I did not really address the email more than that because it was out of mine. But I, I was, I am, I was definitely concerned. Right. For, and we, worried we, about Brent's mental <laughs> health at that point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna make it very. Uh, I'm gonna provide a simplified answer that may or may not be fully representative of of the the background in terms of how this happened or what exactly happened. Okay. But in terms of kind of comparing it to a way that maybe just not laymen like me who aren't living in that world, when you, um, <coughs> you know, when you get a new cell phone and you transfer everything over from your old cell phone, oh. you're taking information that you have in your phone, which is what the information that we have in our district. So we have different, um, different apps to kind of keep that analogy going with information in each of those apps. One app has all the student addresses and content information. The other app has a student, you know, courses and data, all those <coughs> kinds of things. And then what we're doing is we're taking that information, we're transferring it, you know, transferring this information into a new phone, more or less. And in that process, there were some <coughs> things that didn't line up. So what Joe does is he goes through each line of code. Brent, you know, together they're going through making sure that that, that you know, when they reboot the phones, that information is flowing and transferred seamlessly. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where you think you have everything lined up, you think you did everything, saved everything in the cloud, yeah. you did everything right, and then when you make that transfer, you know, there's some things that get a little bit, you know, like, okay, this, this wasn't it, so, you know, what do you do? Let's back out, let's re-save everything again, and let's give it a shot, <coughs> understanding what adjustments you have to make, so. Okay. Um, 
you know, the, the curriculum uh, that this, this organization that, that we selected to provide the curriculum for the PVA. I know that uh, Springfield, Rossford, Anthony Wayne, um, I know there's other districts in Northwest Ohio that, that are using that same curriculum. And, um, you know, we were one of the first ones to, to start school and, and begin it in earnest. So, you know, we're also that, the early, um, you know, folks. So hopefully the, we get it straightened out for our families and I know they're working hard to do that. And, um, you know, we shared this information with our, our neighboring districts so that they know going in. So I think they're making adjustments on Nova side as well in terms of how to make that more seamless for them. So will this adjust the five day trial periods? It has. Yes. Okay. Yes. So they'll yes. have all <clears throat> next week to go Correct. to try it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. No, but, no, it's, yeah. you know, we're, we're sorry that the families experienced that and you know, that's a stressful time for them and mm -hmm. school starting and I can't get it to log in. And, um, you know, so, so some of it is that piece that I described. Some of it is folks just, you know, um, you know, trying to log into your phone the first time and you're missing a step. There's some of that. So, there's, there was a lot of different troubleshooting taking place. So, okay. yeah. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, at this time, I uh, need to take a motion to go into executive session. Oh, we've oh, got no. to do Tom's, Tom's thingy update. at 6 Yeah, I just want, yet. if it's okay, What's I just that? wanted to give an update on six the first two. week of school, if that's okay. Oh, I got the, see, I'm, oh, I'm, yeah. running, I'm running a copy of the agenda <laughs> like yesterday, so I didn't take Brian's yeah, agenda. Yeah, I added, Sorry this, about that. I added <laughs> the presentation, so. <laughs> I'll click being so efficiently. Uh, we'll move, we'll move very quickly. And you so. ruined the segue. Okay. I got them all you set up, and you just wrapped it. Go ahead, Mr. Austin. So, yeah, so just, I'll move kind of quick because there's a couple things that happened this week that we wanted to make you aware of so school took place so that was that was a good thing um, you know and I, I think uh, this was a pretty neat thing and, and it's in, in, in a regular year it would be very ordinary but um, I was at the high school on Tuesday the first day the students are back and I'm, I'm walking in the hallway classes are all in session so the hallways are kind of empty and there's two students that are walking in the same direction that, that I am. So I, I catch up with them and said, welcome back. We're, we're glad you're here. And um, I said, so what are you nervous about right now? And, you know, we, we came into this year nervous about so many things that we've talked about for hours, at, at, you know, as a board, you as a board. You know the virus the spread of the virus you know getting sick getting a family member sick you know are we going to close again all these things that are going through my mind and i'm anticipating these students having that same kind of anxiety about those things and the students turned to me and said yeah we're really nervous and i kind of nod my head like okay you know let's hear it i said we don't know exactly where our classes are <laughs> <laughs> you know so they had their schedules out <laughs> And I think, you know, as you go through the buildings and you see the different kinds of things that are happening, it's school. And not knowing where your second period class is, you know, you're thinking about that and homework and syllabus and all the normal things that are happening. And I've heard from a number of parents who've said, you know, kids are coming home talking about school again. And, you know, those are all really positive things. Um, we still have some significant challenges, so I don't want to give the impression that school's up and running and everything is normal. It's, it's not, but the framework, the, the, the foundation, the, the key elements of what school is, that is present. And even behind masks and even behind, you know, reduced seating on buses and all of those kinds of things, um, it's still school and, and that's really a, a good thing. So, so we have students back at the junior high and high school. Um, today, the, the uh, HPI will have had um, at the end of the day, both grade levels in by themselves. Uh, Jack at Jumpstart in K4 has taken place, so we've had all the appointments and that's underway. And uh, basically Tuesday, August 25th is when everything's going to be back in, in motion. So that's gonna be the day that everyone is back, uh, including the preschool. So um, I mentioned here the PVA extended deadline and opt out, so you know we, we understood the, what was happening there. <coughs> Um, continuing with the highlights, 
Uh, the login and course assignments, you know, we think we have a patch. Um, I know that Brent and Joe were um, working to, to, to make that seamless transfer of information like I described um, work. HPI lunches are now split between the cafeteria and, and the gymnasium, so I know that was a concern coming into this year, so we do have that plan set up and tables and access. Uh, transportation, we're doing head counts because we did that survey with families to see how many children would be riding the buses. We're continuing to look at those numbers because we can't have more students on the bus than when we have seats with this new seating configuration. Um, next week, we'll continue to verify K-8 riders. Um, with the extension of the, the PVA, we know that there's some students that could be coming back. So it'll be a little bit of time for us to kind of settle into you know, that, that transition if people are coming or going um, from PVA before we can really get our, our arms around what is high school transportation gonna look like. So right now we're beginning with high school transportation not available as we've told folks, but once we have a firm number of how transportation's working, then we'll be able to make an announcement and say here's some things that we can offer high school students moving forward by way of transportation. Um, we know that drop off and pick up the first day of school in any of our buildings is always a challenge. Um, <laughs> you know, so at the high school, we know that that's a new wrinkle because we usually had buses and not um, parent drop off. And I know they've been working around how, how to do that. So, um, you know, so I think parents by the time they get to high school have forgotten what, it's, what it was like at the junior high or elementary if they ever had to drop off their child and you know you kind of get away from that and you're kind of reintroduced to it with your 16 year old sitting next to you which has brought a different element to the equation so we we're working through that um, as much as we can um, I'm gonna share with you some information um, we've been trying to capture how to describe what we're doing and, and should we describe this so, so for right now, what we want to do is provide the board, the community, kind of a snapshot of what's happening without personally identifying any individuals or any staff members or anything like that. So we're using kind of raw general terms here. But this week, um, we talk about our tracing program. So what that means is if somebody has COVID symptoms, we are following up with them, and then we're finding out who they may have been in contact with in the district, and making calls and connections, working with the health department. So that describes that tracing. So there were 71 different individuals that were looked at, considered, um, you know, during this tracing process. <coughs> that does not mean we have 71 individuals with COVID. Right. All that means is that that staff had to look and consider with the health department 71 individuals here in the district. So I just, we've talked about how this can, can swell um, and how much time that takes and getting back to families after hours, you know, because they, that's when they return calls. We just wanted to give that snapshot of what that looks like. We have right now, um, this week, one additional employee that was uh, put under quarantine. Um, and again, we can't get into disclosing not always school related sometimes it's someone else from outside of school um, that that causes that to happen um, right and again quarantine means not you don't have covid it means that you've been exposed to somebody um, in a close contact six feet or less 10 or 15 minutes even if you're wearing a mask that is considered that that you would have to quarantine so, so we have 31 students that are quarantined right now this week. Um, employees, ice, so students and then employees. Employee isolated means somebody who does have COVID. So isolated is a term that means that you do have it and you are isolated. So we do have um, one, or I'm sorry, two employees that are isolated. And then students uh, right now this week was five diagnosis. So this isn't a running total but this is just a snapshot for this week. Wow. Employee indirect and other and student indirect other. And this is something that we're doing. It's not part of the CDC or Wood County um, Health, but what we're finding is during this process of the, the 71 tracing, 
we're coming across individuals who have been in contact, but not for that prescribed you know, threshold that, that the CDC and, and ODH and Wood County Health puts out there that you have to quarantine. So if you were with somebody and you had a three minute conversation and you were close and we documented that, we're not sending that, inf we're sending that information to the Wood County Health Department. They're saying that person does not need to quarantine because they were not, you know, they both were in masks. It was a five minute conversation that we could document and based on the definition, that person doesn't have to quarantine. But what we're doing is we, we are, out of an abundance of caution, letting those families know that you did have contact. It was not at the threshold, but you just need to be aware of this so that you can monitor your child's uh, symptoms and their health. So that's something that, that we do um, that's a little bit different, just to make sure that folks know that. Um, so that's where that number 31 and one. So I don't want, that doesn't mean there's 31 other COVID things out there. Mm -hmm. This is just us reaching out to families and saying, here's the situation that, that we have. Um, so, so we'd like to, and we're gonna get feedback and we're continuing to monitor this, but <coughs> we would, we're, we're considering putting out something like this every week so people can understand and see what's happening because I think it's important that folks have an understanding of that. Can we put percentages to that so the total student population, st total employee population, because I think sometimes that gives a truer picture. So right. yeah. I, I just roughly figured, are we at 7,000 total students and employees? Is there a number out there that we know? Yeah, I mean, if you 5,700 would be the number of students, uh, 600 staff members, so that's okay. less than 1% yeah. that have COVID, at this, that, that were diagnosed with COVID this week. I just think the percentages yeah. too, because we see a lot of numbers even on the media, numbers, 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 but look, looking at the whole picture, what is that percentage wise? I mean, not to diminish what right. these numbers are telling us, but right. this is a really good idea too, by the way. I think it's- Yeah, and it builds on what happened last week, because last week there were numbers like this. And, and so, you know, so, you know, so again, we're gonna get feedback and try to tweak this. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a blueprint, you know, in terms of what other districts are doing. So we wanted to make sure that one, we're protecting person, personally identifiable information. We don't want to do that, to share that kind of information that somebody could identify somebody but, but we do want to, to give that snapshot and, and, you know, we may want to say, you know, I can imagine people saying, well, give us the full total for the whole year, how many kids have been, and we do have that information, but we just wanted this week, here's what happened. Um, and, and that gets added to the total. So we'll, we'll, we'll play with this based on feedback that you're, you're all hearing. Mm -hmm. We can make adjustments as needed. So our goal is to provide a very clear snapshot of what's <coughs> happening in the district not to not to not talk about it we would just we would just not have the slide frankly and we just move on so so we're not trying to skew data or anything we're just trying to give an accurate picture because families need to know that i, um, I like ray's suggestion i would also my first gut instinct once i finally realized oh he's talking about this week would be in honor of jarman the delta between uh -huh. this week and last week yeah. um would would that be relevant yep. information because if it's going down we'd like to know that if sure. it's going up it right. means hey mm -hmm. you know what you need to do a better job guys right. of <clears throat> following the guidelines right. and yep. it would be a good way to to throw some caution out there yep. sure yeah and that's good good information not to make more work for you no sorry, we have the data sarah <laughs> stockwell and debbie reddick and, and kit Beller. this is what they've been living in um, all the time. Oh my gosh! And and so they keep this updated very thoroughly. At any given time, we can we can access this data, which is really important to understanding what's happening in your district. We have to be vigilant with how we're keeping kids safe. But we also have to be vigilant with keeping uh, track of of what's happening and what does it mean. To your point, um, is something changing out there? Because yeah. we we said all along we have to be flexible. Well, flexible based on what? these are one of the indicators that we want to, to find. So it's a little daunting putting this out because again, we've not been down this road before. So, um, but I think it's an important step for us. And, and I think this would be a tremendous help to the health department. I think they would, especially for Ben two, yeah, uh, Ben yeah. number two coming in. Yeah. Um, 
what what fascinating information. I think maybe everybody in Wood County should do something yeah. like this. <coughs> so, um, so the governor signed an order on Wednesday night. We received the order, but Tuesday he came out with a speech to talk about athletics. Um, we were kind of waiting that guidance. Um, the details that, that came out actually weren't released until Wednesday, and that's when the planning in earnest began. Um, the governor says it on Tuesday, but we really don't know what <laughs> it says. <laughs> and, then, and then we did get that. So I wanted to just walk us through a little bit about what that means. <coughs> the ink is still wet on that order, and we're reacting. In fact, um, Brooke and I had a meeting set up uh, with the county, uh, Wood County ESC had a meeting set up with Ben, uh, Ben Beatty, who's still helping out with the school aspect of the county in addition to his responsibilities at BGSU. And they were going to talk about how the health department wants a reaction. So Brooke and I are both here. Luckily, we sent Mr. Chaco, our athletic director, to be a participant. So, so this is something that is changing and evolving. So everything I'm going to share with you is based on the most recent information, which can change by this afternoon. Exactly. So, so we wanted to talk a little bit about what athletes and fans can expect to see if they attend one of our events here. So one thing is clear, there's a six foot distance and signage and tape um, on the sidelines with where student athletes need to stand and also where spectators will be directed to, to sit. Um, hand sanitizer and cleaning products should be readily available. No sharing of water bottles, foods, or, or towels. So just some of those kinds of things were outlined in this order in terms of what we can and can't do. Local Health Department and OHSAA will have site inspectors that will come out and ensure that this is happening. Um, so that's uh, a new wrinkle that people will be dropping into different events to make sure that these, all the things that we're gonna talk about are being followed. Um, each site has to have a compliance officer that we have to designate who that person is um, that's not a problem for us because in all of our administrators' contracts, it says other duties as assigned. So, so we already have a compliance officer. So, so administrators will be stepping into that role. But um, every event, and this is the kind of information we need to know how Wood County wants to handle this. But, uh, you know, submitting information to the county as to what the events are, who is the site manager, who's that uh, officer, compli op compliance officer, so if there is a problem, they know who to reach at that event. Um, anybody who doesn't follow this order, including the compliance officer or spectators, um, could result in a second degree misdemeanor and a fine um, no more than $750 or not more than 90 days in jail. So that's part of the order. So it's, it's like you have to do this. Um, you know, so that, that was highlighted. OHSA is, is launching an inspector program where individuals will attend contests throughout the state. They'll call and say, we have somebody who's coming, let us in. We'll talk a little bit about the spectator limits, but um, they're going to do some inspections as well to make sure that everything is being followed. I think the emphasis here is we trust that you're going to do the right things, but we're going to verify that you're doing the right things. Because if there is a break in this process, it will look bad for everybody. I think the stakes are very high. Um, so masks at events, spectators, coaches, and players, you will see masks at those events, indoors or outdoors. Um, coaches need to be in masks. Um, the, you know, you're allowed to take masks off for certain, um, uh, certain conditions uh, that were outlined in, in the, uh, the other governor's orders. Um, children under 10 will not have to be in a mask. Um, but then you can see some of the other things. If you need to, to take a drink or eat, you can take your mask off for that. Players, coaches, trainers must follow the, the same rules. Um, certainly if they're going in to compete, they don't have to have a mask on. Um, but when they're, when they're not competing, the expectation is these things have to be followed. Handshakes, gathering before and after games, um, that's prohibited. So you think about things that cause spread, close proximity, we just talked about less than six feet, being together, you've got people from different communities coming together. So throughout this order, you see a lot of things where people are making sure people are separated away from each other. Um, and and the, the handshake, the long line, people gathering in the end zones, taking a knee, 
families kind of huddled around waiting for the teams to come off the court or field, uh, those things can't happen anymore. Um, so the, the manager of that site has to make sure that people are, are abiding by this. Um, crowd size is something that is also part of this order. Um, there's different calculations for indoor and outdoor. Um, outside, the maximum number of seats um, is, is the lesser of 1,500 or 15% of the fixed seating capacity. So we'll, we'll, in a few slides from now, we'll break down exactly what that looks like for Perrysburg and our member schools in the NLL. But for us, um, you know, we have a capacity and it's 15% of that. You have visitor, you have home guests and tickets. So we'll talk a little bit about that because that's gonna create some, some challenges for spectators. Indoors, it's lesser than 300 spectators or 15% of fixed seating. Um, and then physical, you know, physical uh, separation must be maintained. Six feet of separation between groups. So if a family shows up, they can sit together, but the next family has to be six feet away. So that's gonna create some interesting dynamics in terms of setting up, marking uh, where people can and can't go. Staggered rows prevent contact. General admission is only allowed with six feet of social distancing between groups. Um, you know, so, so they going on with spectators. With limited members, uh, numbers, family and household members should sit socially distanced from others. <coughs> Fans must be six feet apart. Uh, face coverings are required. Um, school should prioritize ticket distribution to families and participants <coughs> first, families of participants. So we'll talk about that. Entry and exits were mentioned. We must create pathways to allow physical distancing from parking to inside the game. So we're looking at all of our venues to see we don't want that long lineup of, of individuals where people are gonna be congregating. So managing that is something that, that we're looking at right now. There should be social distancing plan for leaving the event as well. Um, and, and also uh, if there's inclement weather, you know, people huddle underneath certain locations or you know, what happens if we have to, to, to um, to evacuate the stadium that, that happens every year where you know last year mm -hmm. soccer game you're sitting on aluminum bleachers there's thunderstorms rolling through everybody gets into the, the the junior high gymnasium so how can we make sure that people are spaced if we do have to evacuate so <coughs> they're also limiting the number of participants so if you go to one of our football games we're fortunate to have a large number of of uh, football players on the team um, all of our athletic programs have large numbers. And um, right now, uh, they're limiting it to dressing 60 players. So when you look down on the football field, you will only see 60 players, where other times you might see, like last year, maybe up to 90 players dressed. Um, so that's going to be a change. Uh, soccer is 22, volleyball, field hockey is 15. Um, and, and also, uh, Marching band, uh, pep bands can only perform at home contests. Um, so they, the, the governor does not want us to be taking our bands on the road um, with us. So um, <coughs> cross country, uh, right now participants are limited to 150 per race, which is kind of funny because if our boys and girls ran together, because our teams are so large, we're probably not too far off 150 <laughs> just with our own teams. <laughs> So that's really making an adjustment. One of the largest uh, high school cross country meets in the country is the Tiffin Carnival. Um, and, and I know they canceled that event. And if you've had an opportunity to see that, it's just a mass of humanity in the races mm -hmm. at the finish mm -hmm. lines. And, and that's gonna change how they're going to do, you know, do that. Um, Dwine mentioned that if you watched his speech, the governor, governor said in his speech, you know, shouldn't be running in pack. I think he has a son-in-law that's a cross-country coach, so it's important. You know, he's he's pretty tuned into that sport. Um, but he said, you know, kids shouldn't be running in packs. But there's nothing in the order that talks about how student athletes are to perform their events. They did talk about the um, multi-tournament. So think about like volleyball, which might have a tournament on the weekend, where there's you know we play, you know, Team X at this time and then we break and then we play team Y an hour later and then the winner of those teams play, you know, there's these tournaments that take place. Those are uh, prohibited now. Um, they don't want teams just just 
rotating through playing multiple multiple teams. Um, so so that's something that is different. So we're part of the Northern Lakes League. Um, Richard Brown, I know he he spoke to the board a, a couple of years ago about sportsmanship. He is the commissioner. Uh, we're very fortunate to have the have him leading the league, and and also the athletic directors. There's great cooperation, um, and and they've come up with a plan to address many of these things in terms of how to look in the NLL. So I wanted to just kind of walk through that piece a little bit. So we have to evaluate our seating capacities based on the guidance. There was 15% or a fixed number. Um, we have to promote social distancing. What the league said is that if we are having an, a, home event, a home event in Perrysburg, we want to designate of that available seating capacity 75% for the home fans. But we also want to make available 25% of the tickets for visitors. So if you're a senior, you, you have a senior athlete, you're traveling to Napoleon for a league match, um, there should be some tickets available for, for those families. It's not going to be all, but we're going to have to prioritize you know, who has first right at those tickets. And, and they're working through that right now. There'll be more communication. So what does that mean for us? This is a chart of all of our league schools. Um, so for football stadium capacity, um, you know, uh, Perrysburg has the seating capacity, fixed seating capacity. This doesn't take into account all the people that line the fences. This is just, <laughs> as they say, butts and seats, um, 5,300. So 15% capacity, that means the most that we can have attend a football game is 795 wow. visitors, or spectators, I'm sorry. And then if we apply that 75%, that means 596 tickets will be available for Perrysburg fans, and then 199 will be available for opposition fans, that's 25%. So for us, when you think about just the logistics and say, all right, football player families, if you offer four tickets per the 60 that are dressed, I mean, you're, you're almost there. Right. Mm -hmm. so, the math, so, so just to give it perspective, it is not going to be the mass of Perrysburg students huddled together, cheering, you know, the old timers that are coming back for every game you know, this is gonna look very different this fall. So we want to start communicating to the public about that. So um, that would include student spectators too then, right? It doesn't matter. It's spectator, wow. whether it's family or, or, yeah. So the student body will have trouble finding their way into probably football games. Right. You, got, you have band and, and yeah, cheerleading, cheerleading families they also. They will mixed. also be part of that mix too, yeah. 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 So um, if you, if you, a lot, allocate so many for cheerleading families and band families, all of a sudden there, there won't be any, depending on what that level, is it four, is it staggered, yeah. um, how many can, can how, right. you know, how many tickets in the band? There so was a question. Simple math on the 596 of four tickets is 150 family families or yeah. family units or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Yeah. You get there quick. Yeah. And that's, like I said, that's just what it, it It'll be basically a pretty intimate, almost like graduation used to be, where we have so many tickets and that's it. And families, you know, um, that's a challenge. I mean, my family is sick, so we would have to make decisions just to get our immediate family there. So we, we know that that's going to be a struggle for families. So yeah, and, the, and the tickets are not purchased at the gate. They're online. So that the way the program's set up, they know who the priority would be. Yeah. Yeah, so, so and then soccer stadium. So, so for us, that's our number. But if, if you're heading out to, you know, Northview, for example, which is one of the smallest stadiums in the, in the league, um, we're looking at 75 tickets available to visitors for our families there. <laughs> so now we're talking almost one per, not even one, you know, one, not even two per athlete. So that, that will be a challenge. Um, soccer stadiums, again, there's different <coughs> soccer stadiums. We use our stadium, um, you know, in Perrysburg. So, so soccer is one of those sports where you might have students participating because you don't have marching band, you don't have cheer, 
and you're limited with um, you know 15 you know athletes so so you could that that could be a popular venue for for uh, students who are looking to do something is soccer um, but you can see there's other soccer stadiums Anthony Wayne has a very small soccer stadium for example visiting tickets only nine um, nine. so nine <laughs> <laughs> so um, doesn't seem worth <laughs> nine I mean, South it should be is zero. 19. and if you go to those other venues people bring bag chairs you know I mean there's there's some small bleachers but people spread out they stand so this order doesn't address that so it, you know people say well wait those I've been to that game there's lots of people that go to that stadium but a lot of them are in bag chairs or sitting this doesn't permit that uh, it doesn't account for that so those are the kinds of things we're going to talk about with with okay. the Wood County Health Director but the order is pretty clear switching to the um, volleyball the gym capacity um, you can see Perrysburg uh, right now the maximum so we're at the maximum of what was in the order which is 300 so 225 75 guest tickets that could be another venue where students could could come and cheer on the jackets so that tickets could be av available to the general public um, so um, and again you know Bowling Green if you've been to their gym one of the smallest in the league um, you know looking at 24 tickets so that's just not even two per athlete, um, you know. And so we're gonna, you know, we'll be working through this. Again, the ink's not dry on what this looks like. Um, system checks uh, before the contests. So before you're heading in there, a process where you're taking your temperature, you're asking those questions about your health and conditions. Um, we wanna make sure that that's happening. Um, we're asking spectators to do those those tests themselves before they come take your temperature before you go to the volleyball game um, It's important that that again. We remain vigilant not only with our student athletes, but the people that are entering in these venues um, Because that could be uh, it um, The other Because of what I just described there's some passes, you know Perrysburg very popular is the St. Stinger passes, which if you're a senior citizen, you get into any home uh, athletic event free. And because we have to actually count noses, and we have an unlimited number of people that have those that can show up at any given time, um, all that pass and other league passes that, that are granted, um, we're not gonna accept those anymore because we have to have a specific count as to how many can be there. And if 50 people show up with stinger passes and they're not in the ticketing system, there's no way to adjust the ticket sales based on who might be showing up. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to make some adjustments. NLL league passes uh, are given to, to individuals, coaches in the district. Now, um, you know, that those aren't gonna be available because why? We have to have a specific count as to exactly how many per the order. And there's going to be inspectors that are going to show up and you know and count and and then nobody wants to spend 90 days in jail although <laughs> that sounds better and better every day in certain <laughs> cases so um, ray mentioned electronic ticketing <clears throat> and and that is something that that uh, chuck is, is is working out i think the other leagues are participating in this and what we're doing is two days prior to the event we're opening up the ticket window just to parents so they can purchase their allotted to give them the first chance. And then after uh, those two days, we'll open it up to the general, you know, to, to the other general public. So again, trying to give priority. That's our plan now, 12 hours into this order. Um, there might be some adjustments, but going in, this is what we're thinking. We do have an athletic event tonight and, and we're working to put things together to, to make sure we're following all of these restrictions uh, that are the, all the things that are in this order. So Friday night football game, um, you know, tickets for home and visiting parents will go on sale at 8 a.m. on Tuesday. Tickets will be available until Thursday night at 11.59 p.m. Any remaining We're tickets? We're going to have people sitting in the schools? No, it's the all online. So it's like oh, Ticketmaster. Okay, because it says there'll yep. be a window. Uh, you meant window. a virtual yes. window. Yes, okay. sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I was That's thinking. a good clarification. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want the job of 
saying until one until midnight. Yeah, the other duties as assigned. You're handing out <laughs> tickets till midnight. Um, we'll have people camping out. It'll be like a Who concert. The um, so we're we're looking at. Uh, um, again, this is our plan going in. There may be some adjustments, feedback that we're getting, um, you know, what we can do. And, and um, it'll be, I have not uh, looked at this model, but how it was described to me, the, the system, this, this home ticket uh, system, you go on, you click the seats that you want, and it counts how many seats. So we go in and set up the schematic. And then it's just like a, a ticket where you click on your seats and those seats aren't available to the next person that goes in and tries to purchase. And that's how we're keeping track of, of those. Um, so, you know, I'm sure we'll make adjustments as we go. I think the other important thing I wanted to end with is it's really a culture change, not only for athletics, but also in the schools. Um, we, we had a, a general coaches meeting this uh, past Thursday morning. And one of the things that we talked about is the fact that we need to change the culture. You know, and we've talked about this with our principals and staff. We have a culture here in our athletic program and also in our schools that when, when Timmy or Susie has a runny nose, the expectation by coach is you're there. You show up. And our kids have a tremendous work ethic, and they're going to want to show up. And, and we've always done that. And that's been kind of encouraged in terms of what we do. You play through, right? You rub dirt on it, you get back in the game. If you're not throwing up, you're okay, you can play. And we can't do that anymore. We have to begin to say, when mom calls and says, Timmy, Coach Kriegel, Timmy has a runny nose. Coach Kriegel has to say, thank you, that was the right decision, keep him home, we're glad he's home. And the next day when Timmy shows up to practice, say, you made the right call. And that is so different from what we've done. And it was interesting because we have to do that with staff too. A lot of our staff are very dedicated. And while I was addressing the, the coaches talking about this with Sarah and, and Deb in the morning, um, I got a text message from someone here in central office saying, I got up this morning, didn't have a temperature, went to bed with a headache, I'm driving in, I just don't feel myself. I'm turning around and going home. Now, six months ago, that person is sitting at their desk. Today, you know, I have to follow my own advice. Thank you, that was the right call, appreciate it. If, you know, hopefully you feel better, check in later. Um, and, and we have to make those adjustments. And, and that's tough for a culture that is 100% full go, let's get it done, let's do what we need to do and push through it. And um, we have to make that adjustment. Families have to also be with us with that culture because they, they, they allow that culture to happen too. And um, so, um, you know, that, that's gonna be a change for us. I think that's real important. Um, we've also talked about the fact that, you know, part of the culture is, you know, well, we have team dinners every Friday before the event or after the event, let's all get together, let's do a team dinner, let's go to somebody's house, all those kinds of things that are part of it. Fundraisers, we're gonna have a car wash Saturday, you see the cheerleaders out you know, with signs. Those kinds of things have to stop too because that is where spread can happen. And that's the hardest thing I think that we have to realize is all these protocols that I just went through now are to prevent the spread so that we can have school, most importantly, because. Athletics are nice, but they're secondary. But, so we can have school, not athletics, that's secondary in my opinion, but these things have to be in place because you saw that tracing that somebody making a bad decision can impact so many others. And we've had to learn, we've had successes and failures, but yesterday we had hundreds of kid, kids participating in extracurriculars and everything went well. And they're back today. But we have learned from those cases where, you know, for no fault of their own, things happen. And as coaches and as staff, we have to create an atmosphere where we're not encouraging something to take place that undoes everything that we've done all week long. We've taken all these precautions in the classroom, and then there's a huge party. And we talked about that at the last board meeting. That just undercuts everything we've done in one, in one hour. So, so it's, it's daunting. It is more questions than answers, 
and you know we're going to have an event tonight we're going to do our very best to follow these um, continue to refine them and make it an experience that you know again extends that learning that classroom beyond the walls of the building into the arena or the court or the the course and um, you know that's our goal we'll do it as long as we can but if we reach a point where these things break down and they're impacting the classroom then we'll be back here recommending that we we take we suspend or we stop because the academic is our <coughs> most important piece um, that's why we're here and you know who wins and what game those are all fun things but there are much more important issues that we're trying to deal with and we can't risk those that's why these things are so important so I appreciate you letting me kind of walk through these and I'm sure there'll be much much more to come out so Thank you, Mr. Hostler. Thank Can you. I oh. ask if um, are clubs and extracurricular activities being held at the school levels uh, throughout the district? So that'll be a case-by-case -case basis. So we've, we've talked about that because so many other um, groups and activities, you know, can you, can you not meet? Can you do social distancing? And some can, are going to try. Um, you know, student government, can they meet virtually? Can they spread out? Can they keep the numbers low? while they do their activities. I think they're gonna try to make an effort, but there are some activities that we're just holding off on just because we, we don't know if we can do those. Um, you know, and, and you know, that's unfortunate. So it's kind of a wait and see for many of those activities, but it's a, there's no flat answer. It's a case by case basis, so. Uh, uh, along those lines, I thought I'd heard the governor was gonna be giving some sort of guidelines for that as well. Is, it, am I, is that happening, do you know, or? Um, Am I that, that's my understanding too, but you know we're mm. in school now, so I don't know if that'll come next month or this <laughs> month. Or, and I, I know he's got a lot of things, so I don't mean to to take yeah. a take a poke. But you know we're we need to plan now, so we're moving forward with kind of that case by case basis. But yeah, we're hoping for some guidance. Okay. Um, two questions. Yeah. What about performing arts? Can you talk about performing arts in both junior high high school? So performing arts, that's a great question. That's one of the things the governor is, is supposed to, to weigh in on. At his press conference, he said, you know, this is an important part. Um, without any guidance right now, our understanding is we are looking at how can we have those performances and basically using this athletic as a blueprint. So, you know, keeping the rows empty initially because people are projecting their voices. We know that's how it's spread. Um, so we're looking at how do we set up the, the theater with reduced seating, spread out. Um, we're also looking at, you know, how can we stage students on the stage with social distancing as much as we can. So our goal is to work towards offering those activities as well, using this as a blueprint until the governor comes out with some type of order that might, you know, send us in a different direction. But um, those activities and events are as important as, you know, performing, you know, performing in those venues is just life is just as life changing as it is taking the court or, you know, I agree. you know, so, so we've, we're, we're looking to figure out a way to make that happen. But like football, it's going to be very different. Sure. You know, it's going to look different, but at the end of the day, it gets the kids, the spotlight on the stage, getting those experiences. But um, there's some unique challenges there um, that, that we have to think through. But sure. Yeah, our goal is to, to do what we can to, to try to provide those opportunities. Okay. Yeah, good question. And then secondly, can you address the, um, um, which Sue did bring up, the high school um, drop off? Are they using both where the buses used to pull in and drop off? Are both places accessible as far so, as? So my understanding is that they that they are, um, and I know that I know that they've made a couple of changes with the every day trying to refine things. Um, so that's what's happening. You know, that's my understanding now um, <coughs> of what happened. I don't know today if if they've made those changes. I haven't gotten an update, but I know they were looking to make some you know some different adjustments. Um, the challenge will be when buses start to roll into the high school, which will be a good thing, which could reduce the um, overall number of cars. Now we've got buses and passenger cars, and that's going to create a little bit of a challenge for us. But, yeah, so I, I think, you know, they're modifying the plans as we go. So. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, 
the the Harvard recommendations for the the 20 things uh, it was on the news last night I, I googled it uh, I was so pleased to see we are really there we are like their contract tracing contact tracing um, social distancing masks uh, we we are there the only place that I think I wonder about and I know that uh, operations has started to address the air filters mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we all have to keep in mind is all the things we're now asking people to do all the modifications to the buildings we're asking schools to do all cost money uh, I noticed that the uh, filter thing was if we can do that, it was going to come out of the PI levy. All these things stress the budget tremendously. And given the fact that, that the, uh, our, our income is going to be down, I, I think it behooves us to really concentrate on how can we make the budget work. And what can we do to make sure that the PI levy passes? Because that's another million dollar hit if it doesn't. And every million dollar just adds up. <laughs> Funny how that works. Oh my gosh. So, I, and I, the other thing I think we all, we as a board need to be appreciative of is the amount of effort everyone is putting in to make this work. It's just overwhelming to me. I talked to Sarah Stockwell, and I said, oh, Sarah, I hope it gets better. And she said, I hope I live through it. <laughs> I mean, I, I know she is pushed to the absolute break. And, and I am so appreciative of the contract we just approved today. Those people have taken the m biggest hit financially and yet they're there and they're smiling. And I, I just give everybody so much credit for what we are doing. <clears throat> I do have one question. Yes. If, if you don't ride the bus in the morning because your parents are able to drop you off, can you ride it in the afternoon? Um, so what we've asked parents to do is if they are going to ride in the survey that we did either way you know let, okay. you know so we account for that so okay our I mentioned that our staff or one of the slides said that we're going to continue to do head counts because right now we we took all of those kids that are in you know that that indicated that at some point I might be in the morning or on the way home and we're looking at the the ridership and and we um, their, their buses are a little bit light right now because we're saving seats for those families. So we'll okay. be continuing to communicate with families to say, you know, is, you know, are you with us or, or not? We need well, to kind of know. So, and yeah. it, gets, it gets tricky because right now I'm energetic. It's a beautiful day. I want to walk to school. In November, you're <laughs> not so going to say, oh, golly. <laughs> yeah. I really want to yeah. walk to school. And, and so we tried to account any family that said we're going to use transportation, whether they're showing up or not, we still have to account for that seat because they said at some point. Yeah. And, and if they're involved in an activity or sport, then all of a sudden in November when the sport's over, they're showing up and we have to have a spot for them. That's why we're, we're not ready to commit to, okay, here's what our high school transportation is going to be um, moving forward. Because again, the law says once we offer that to our students, we can't take it away. Right. So if we overcommit, then we're in a really tough bind. Um, you know. So, but that's that's a good question, Gretchen. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Then at this time, <laughs> we need a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of this negotiations with public employees and the purpose of compensation of public employees. Is there a motion to go into executive? So moved. Second. 
Roll call, please, Mr. Pennington. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mrs. Downs? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. And I don't expect any action to take place after this executive session. So at this time, we'll be going into executive session.